All right. Now, so there's a lot of things going on. Um, you may have seen posted on Way Beyond uh, a video, a Zoom meeting I had with Sean Finnegan on healing from bullying. And uh, we recorded about 45 minutes of video, but I only got halfway through my my notes and stuff. So we did a second half of it, and that's going to be published later this week. So um, I'm real blessed with that material. I think it, it turned out well. And um, so... That's one thing that's on Way Beyond. You can click on that. Uh, also, um, this weekend, I'm going to be meeting with another group uh, against bullying uh, from angelsanddoves.com. And uh, the woman, Kim Harvey, actually lives in Indianapolis. And she travels all around the United States. She's been to over a hundred schools and also a hundred workshops, uh, encouraging teaching about how to cancel out bullying. It's anti-bullying. And so I wrote to her and shared some things about how I have the other side of it how to help the victims and so anyway i had the material right there already because i had sent it out to kate and to aaron and so anyway i it was right on the on my mind and so i wrote her an email and she responded so maybe this material is finally going to get out and really help people because they they seem to deal with the no bullying no bullying but they haven't really dealt with the victims and all the other times that i tried to connect connect with news media and other websites when it came up in years past no one responded but now i'm getting response so that's that's a door that is opening that you can pray for, please. Um, so that's what's happening with me. And then, of course, we had that tremendous testimony from Kate Williams about what happened, that miraculous healing. And so uh, Kate and I were talking earlier, and I'd like to have her share a little bit to follow up with that so uh let me see here kate you can unmute yourself please all right go ahead and share dear okay hello everyone good evening um i am blessed to share that in response to some of the things that john shared about the bullying experience that he had and significant events in my own past, et, et cetera. Um, I currently work as an administrator for a mental health counseling practice. It's Christian, all Christians. You have to be a Christian to work there. And we offer Christian counseling. And many, many, a significant number of our patients have experienced bullying and now they're adults and now they have to find ways to survive and get past it. And so I've seen that side of it. And my job there is of course, to help them get the help that they need so desperately because it is crippling their lives. This, the aftermath, the stuff that never was handled at all, mostly. So I began to see that I could have an impact in that area by teaching not just the folks, the therapists who I work with, but the entire church community prior to somebody having 
decades of pain and torment from a terrible past that they cannot seem to get over. And so I've put together a teaching on forgiveness and it's been, I've taught it many times now, but in addition to that, the church that I go to nearby, it's about almost a thousand people that go there. They have made my teaching, they've filmed it and made it mandatory for anyone seeking membership in this church. My goodness. That we would, yep, that we would um, make that available to people. We're also writing a book, uh, me and a small team of dedicated folks, Christians, who I trust and, and love. We are writing a book on um, how to do church when forgiveness is something that is taught, not just read, you don't just read it in the Bible and go, wouldn't that be great if we could get there? We're teaching people how, and that's not a subject that many are taught, that it's not modeled for them. It is not something they've ever seen happen because what do we do with the memory of the thing that tormented us, the person, the the situation, something will trigger it. Something will re- cause it to come to our memory. We have to have tools and some way to deal with that biblically and personally. And so that was a, a great result of Reverend Nessel, what you shared, much of that, and what God worked in my own heart. And I've got this teaching now that is going around all around my area. And people are reporting that they have been uh, breaking chains in their lives that have held them back for decades because of a tormentuous bullying incident or several even that they just didn't understand. They didn't know what to do with the painful memory. And that is part of what we do where I work and where I church and where I fellowship. That is part of the healing process of getting rid of the pain that is associated with these tormentuous problems. So we take it a step further. We don't just say, well, they shouldn't have done that and it's wrong and, and you know, it, it's bad. We've got to come against the bullying. What about the victim, like you said, Reverend Nessel, that has the tormentuous memory? And What do we do with that? How do we help them? How do we help them overcome and get past it where they can forgive, where it's a possibility to live outside of that, no longer chained to it, no longer punished by the memory? Because the incident's bad enough, but the memory will keep punishing you if you don't release it. So this class, that it's part of a class, but they've, mine is the only segment that is mandatory. And I've heard amazing feedback of people who have finally been able to get around that and past it and now are teaching their own children, their you know, grown children and little ones, about how to live in that place and to be a a mature Christian without the shackles of the tormentuous pain. Just like Christ, if if anyone, he was tormented and abused and, and hated and despised and all of those things, but he found and knew a way to keep going. So when we tap into that, We are victorious over the memory. The memory no longer holds us back. It no longer has power over us. So that's a little bit about what's happening here in my neck of the woods. I'm very pleased and proud that I could be part of this move of God here. And it's uh, all over my workplace, all over the neighborhood, all over the, the streets here. And this people god is drawing people from all over the state to move here to come here do business here because there's light where there used to be darkness there is now light and we're so thrilled to be visualizing it seeing it unfold in in a physical sense and a spiritual sense where are you so 
I'm in uh, the western half of Connecticut, um, west of New Haven. I live probably 20 minutes from New Haven, so New Haven County, and thereabouts. Uh, the uh, practice that I administer has offices all throughout western and southern Connecticut. Okay. Now, I wanted also to ask you, thank you for that. I wanted to ask you about any uh, follow-up with that miracle that happened. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I've had several people come to me and say, uh, can you heal me? Can you pray for me? Can you help me? And refer to the miracle. And then others say, I want to know how I can be somebody who does that for others. How did you get there? What was your training or how did you come to this place? So I've been able to share with them one-on-one -on -one and small groups also. And one of the therapists at my office will call me fairly often and say, did you heal anyone today? Tell me about it. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm enjoying it very much. All right. Now, one last question. What denomination is that church? It's a, a loose, and I mean loose, connection to the Assemblies of God. Okay. And they they are part of that sort of overall tree, but they very much have their own way of doing things. So it, it's kind of a, a, I wouldn't say rogue, but a, um, a front runner in the uh, in the war against religion and denominations. We we are definitely different than all the other assembly of god churches that i've ever known and so that's why i'm part of it it's it's something quite amazing god is really moving things in in this church body here and we're from all walks of life every possible corner of the earth so it's it's quite something well i am glad you found where you fit me too yes Thank you very much for that sharing. That you are most is, welcome. That's wonderful. See, and that's my vision for all of you that you get to share your riches. Of course, the ideal situation, of course, would be if there were a like minded fellowship nearby that you can participate in. But there are other fellowships where you can fit. I know sometimes people think that our differences in doctrine are too large to allow for that, but that's not true. Romans 14 still works, and we concentrate on righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, like it says. So um, I look forward to hearing from some of you that adventure out to do the same thing following Kate's example. So um, I am just so blessed that things are opening up. So anyway, we're going to have manifestations and hear from God and pray. And then we're going to start. <laughs> so Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone tonight. Thank you for the movement of your word. Wherever it is, doesn't need a label because Holy Spirit doesn't have a label. Um, and we thank you for that, that we are in one body and we can act like that and walk in wisdom and share our riches and see your deliverance. So thanks for that. Thanks for opening up doors for that to happen for your word to move and for us to see how you work in us for us to understand what our ministries are in the body of christ and that we can grow in them and teach others how to do the same we thank you for working in us and opening up those 
golden doors and for us to notice them and be brave and bold enough to walk through because working miracles is like falling off a grease log backwards. Once we know what to do, we just command it and it comes to pass. So Father, thanks for opening doors and opening eyes and opening hearts so that we can see that come to pass. Also, we thank you for the manifestations that we can hear from you tonight, what you want us to hear. Thanks for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Ray Beats, Ray, I'd like for you to have a word of prophecy, Ray. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Go ahead, sir. Look unto me, my blessed ones, for I have called you to be my family and to be my children. Whatever you need, I will supply, for I am your God, I am your Father, and I am your all. So don't look to anyone else. Just continue to look to me. Look to my word, for that's where you will know me. Look to me in prayer. Look to me in your thinking day by day, for I will walk with you, and I will talk with you, and I will guide your steps, whatever you need, you have. Amen. Uh, Aaron, Aaron, I would like for you, please, to unmute yourself and have a word of prophecy. Aaron, if you're hearing my voice here, go ahead. Be not afraid to walk forth and speak my word, for my word is life and my word is truth. This world needs you to speak my word. The world is dark, and you are my lights in it. So shine brightly, shine forth, and never fear to touch anyone with my word. Amen. Thank you. Um, Ed Brockman. Ed, can you have a word of prayer, please, sir? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for just what was shared about peace in the body of Christ and unity in the body of Christ, that, that we just hold fast that which is good. And we, we don't have to run away from things that were different than what we previously thought. And I thank you that we can just reach out with great tenderness and love and to be able to minister, but also keep our hearts open for what anyone else might be able to teach us that you can confirm in our hearts and that we can grow thereby in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ed. And by the way, Ed does that in his area too. So you're a great example of that, sir. All right. Let's see here. Well, we're ready for you, Ren. Go ahead and unmute yourself. The recording is going and the Screen sharing is all set. So take it away, sir. Bless you. Bless you. Thank you. God bless all of you in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, by whom all bars are broken and all who will may go free. For the living God has raised him from the dead and seated him in glory. I've updated the uh, order of empires represented in Daniel's vision of the four beasts that arise from the great sea. Let me show it to you. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? It's here somewhere. There it is. Okay. Okay, we can see it. Okay, great. So anyway, up here, just by way of review, the uh, image of the empires from Daniel 2. So when I refer to the empire of brass, you know what I'm talking about. And uh, down here is the update uh, I changed with uh, my ideas about the lion with eagle's wings and the heart of a man is going with um, Rome to Persia. So a little bit of a significant difference. But the reason I did it is I learned that there was one style of Persian royal griffin during the Archimed Empire in Persia uh, known as the Sherdal or lion eagle in Persia. Uh, this symbol has been found in the ruins of Darius I's citadel at Susa. I got that information from A.T. 
Olmsted's work, History of the Persian Empire. I'll put a link to the PDF uh, with the session notes. This symbol does not arise by metaphor, but from the history and culture of Persia. This use of symbol without an original originating metaphor also occurs in Ezekiel 29, three and four. I'll read it to you. Speak and say, thus said the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon, sea monster, uh, relative of the Nile, uh, relative to the Nile would be the crocodile, that lies in the midst of his rivers, and which says, my river is my own, and I have made it for myself. But I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales, and I will bring thee up out of the midst of the rivers, and all the fish of the rivers shall stick to thy scales. In his companion Bible, Bollinger notes that the dragon was a crocodile, for the symbol of Egypt found on ancient Roman coins was the crocodile. There's kind of a double meaning here, because indicating that God is also speaking of future events of the great white throne judgment. But in historic application, this crocodile represents the evil force animating Egypt. And the fish are the crocodile's minions. Likewise, God's prophecy in Daniel 7, 4 confronted the devil spirit forces that would have animated Persia more fully if God had not intervened. Here is Daniel 7, 4. The first beast was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Daniel received this vision in the first year of Belshazzar. The Bible records a third royal year for Belshazzar. So there were at least two more years before the Persian Cyrus would rise to prominence. In his vision, the Persian griffin's wings are clipped. And the lion was made to stand on its hind feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. God beat the stuffing out of this poor griffin. The griffin became far less beast-like. All of this sheds more light on Daniel 10, verse 20, where it says, And he, the angel, said, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia? And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. This prophecy in Daniel 10 is from the third year of Cyrus the Great but it plainly foretells that the angel's battle with the prince of Persia would continue from 536 of Cyrus's reign until the rise of Alexander the Great in 331 BC. That is over 200 years of battle. And we thought a 15 round boxing match was too long. Let's look at Ephesians 612 one more time. Many of you have it memorized. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what it says. We're in this fight now with the angels of God as our allies. Wow. What in the world happens when we renew our minds, walk with Father, and pray with the Spirit? Mighty deeds. This God's word guarantees. Sometimes we see it. Sometimes maybe we don't, but when we put on the armor of God, and when you and I renew our minds and walk in love and grace, big things do happen. No wonder 1 Corinthians 2 says that if the enemy had known the mystery and the riches of the glory of that mystery, he never would have crucified the Lord of glory. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Side note, when Daniel sees angels and receives these symbolic visions, which of the manifestation of the spirit outlined in 1 Corinthians 12 is foremost? Yes, of course, discerning of spirits. Word of knowledge and word of wisdom were certainly part of these visions, but discerning of spirits was very much a part. Unlike the history of Greece and Rome, the Persian Empire went through what can only be described as a spiritual change. Cyrus's uh, proclamation to rebuild the temple was the will of God, but Darius I's part in rebuilding the temple and the walls of Jerusalem and his help in resettling God's people in Jerusalem is also very remarkable. Then as Artaxerxes, uh, or as high king, his marriage to Esther continued to allow God to work in the empire to protect his people. Finally, in this period, the empire began to follow the monotheistic teachings of Zoroaster, under which the Magi thrived. We don't know how God would have symbolized the changes in the Babylonian Empire because it was not part of this prophecy. 
However, the dramatic changes happening with the griffin are much more easily applied to Persia than to Greece or Rome. So here we go, we scrolled it down. Yeah, the empire symbols are not in chronological order of each empire's rise and fall. The first empire, Persia, as symbolized by the griffin, is nevertheless the next empire to rise and the beast is the last empire to fall. The other empires do not undergo dramatic changes. The other symbols for the empires are based on metaphors. For instance, as we'll see tonight, the four-headed leopard matches the Greek empire. However, the choice of a leopard as a symbol is based on a metaphor exclusively focused on the nature of Alexander's military. Alexander's conquests were amazingly fast and his empire would eventually be divided into four parts. The empires above are listed according to military might. Yes, the leopard takes out the lion. The irony of Alexander's victories over Persia are outlined again by the goat of Macedonia taking out the ram of Persia. According to natural law, this should not have happened. Nevertheless, the lion is first in military strength. The bear is second in strength in the animal kingdom. But the leopard, though deadly, is not the equal of the lion or the bear. The beast itself, uh, the last monster, is of a different type or nature than the first kingdoms of the first uh, three visions. Daniel received the vision of the four beasts in the first year of Belshazzar. This was his second vision of Christ's coming. In the third year of Belshazzar, two years later, Daniel received a third vision of the second coming that included the prophecies of the rise of Alexander the Great and the division of the Greek empire into four kingdoms. Uh, this vision is recorded in Daniel 8, and that's where we're going this evening. But one more update. Scroll the screen a little bit. Once again, last week I was going at breakneck speed, and I simply plugged in the King James Version of 1 Peter 1.11, which reads, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. I forgot how, not misleading, but how confusing the King James Version translation is. The Spirit of Christ which was in them is not an accurate reading of the Greek. As Reverend Nessel notes, the placement of, uh, of the of Christ follows the verb signify. Hence, it should read, the spirit which was in them did signify of Christ. The reason he writes for this uh, grammar for the verb uh, signify is given on page 178 in Bauer's Lexicon, where he discusses the cases following the verb. Information about what is given is in the accusative case. Inform information about to whom it is given is in the dative case. And descriptive information concerning the whom is in the genitive. Here's a word by word translation, what I put up on the screen, uh, which is kind of lexicon like and really kind of clunky. I'm hoping you can make the leaps and put it together in a way that makes sense to you. But it also points out the Greek a little bit more clearly. Searching what, and that's Tina in the, the accusative, or what manner of time, the then en is the word translated in them, which is correct for most New Testament Greek. We'll, we'll look at it as far as with in just a moment. Uh, what or what manner of time the with them spirit did signify of Christ. Of Christ is an objective genitive that may be translated concerning Christ. Uh, when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. Do you see how the correct word order locks in the context did signify of Christ? When? When what? the sufferings of Christ, and his glories to follow. That's what it was signifying of Christ. So spirit is the subject of the sentence. It's in the nominative case. Dignity did signify as the main verb. Because Tina is in the accusative case, the grammar specifies uh, about what. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit did signify what. What did the spirit signify? Of Christ is the answer. Because English is a word order language, when we put of Christ in the correct word order, we naturally hear the objective genitive. Of Christ means concerning Christ. Uh, in case you're in interested, Daniel Wallace's Greek grammar, Beyond the Basics, uh, goes into great depth on all this. I will go ahead and link this to the uh, teaching. So if you want to, you can pull it up and you won't uh, 
have to rely on anyone who knows Greek because you'll know it all. Also, uh, I would go with translating the E-N as with. The E-N usually translated in, in the Koine New Testament uh, to mean God's spirit with his men of old, because we're talking about the men of old, we're talking about the Old Testament guys, uh, his men of old makes the, would, would make this the last in a sequence of uses with the Hebrew preposition B. Brown driver Briggs were 974. Uh, and its Aramaic counterpart, Brown drivers and Briggs were 10784. Uh, the concordances don't mess with the prepositions because there are too many of them to catalog. Anyhow, these Old Testament uses show the relationship between God's spirit and his prophets over time. The Septuagint uses E-N to translate these Old Testament uses. In all of these instances in the Old Testament, the Septuagint's preposition E-N should be translated with in English. There are nine of these Old Testament Hebrew uses of B with spirit uh, with a man of God. I'll put these on the session notes, but they're Genesis 41, Numbers 27, and then the rest of the uses, interestingly, are in Daniel. Oh, I put them up there. You can already see them. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close screen now. So we're finally caught up. So please turn to Daniel 8.1. We'll be there for a while as we study Daniel's third vision of the second coming. Daniel's vision uh, is leaving wild animals and now moving into the domestic animals and their ways. Darius 8.1 reads, In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. After that which appeared to me at the first is a reminder that the listing of the beasts is in the immediate context of Daniel 7. For instance, as in the second vision, this third vision does not include Babylon at all. Likewise, the events foretold show the future historic events leading to Christ's first and second coming. The Bible does not indicate whether Belshazzar's third year was his last year, the year in which uh, the writing on the, was on the wall. But if the third year is the last year of Babylon, this vision would have occurred just before Babylon fell to Cyrus the Great. The latest then, this prophecy could have been given, would be in 539 BC, but could have been given significantly earlier. Nabonidus reigned in Babylon for 17 years, so he could have made his son a crown prince or co-regent more than a decade uh, before Babylon fell. Daniel 8, 2. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass when I saw, uh, when I saw that I was at Shushan in the palace which is the, in the province of Elam. And I saw a vision, and I was by the river Ule. The winter palace of Shushan was in Elam, a central province in the Persian Empire. The record in Nehemiah 1.1 supports the idea of the winter palace. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hashaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, that's the ninth month, in the 20th year as I was in the Shushan palace. Uh, Chislu is the ninth month of the Hebrew calendar, which corresponds to our November or December. Likewise, Esther dates a gathering at Shushan in Adar, or early spring, and Ahazero's uh, magnificent party lasted for about half the year. The vision of being at Shushan establishes that Babylon is not part of the coming prophecy. This prophecy began in a period in which ba the Babylonian Empire was no more. Daniel 8.3 then I lifted up my eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Daniel 8.20, an angel interprets this symbolism as representing the kingdom of Media and Persia. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. The angel has given the key information so that the meaning of the other elements of the prophecy can be made plain. The ram represents the entire course of the Persian Empire from Cyrus in 538 BC until the fall of Darius III in 331 BC. This passage of time is achieved with the symbol of the varying size of the ram's two horns. In, old, in the Old Testament history, chapter 5, in the session called The Titles of the Persian Kings, we discuss the interesting manner in which throughout Daniel, the empire is called the kingdom of the Medes and Persians. 
but that in 515 BC, 23 years later, uh, in Esther, the empire is called the kingdom of the Persians and the Medes. Daniel 5 revealed the handwriting on the wall showed that the kingdom of Babylon would be divided between the Medes and the Persians. That's why there are two horns on the ram. One horn, horn represented the Medes, and the second represented the Persians. The later or second horn, the Persian horn, had become the dominant horn as the empire reached its zenith. This prophecy would have been profitable for God's people awaiting Christ's first coming, for they would know that the dominance of the Persia, uh, dominance of the Persians in the empire would signal the coming of Greece. While there were, according to scriptures, two kings of the empire of the Persians and the Medes in the days of Darius the Mede and in the days of Darius the First, these two kings were not co-regents, for their kings, uh, for the for both kings were not co-rulers concerning the entire empire. Artaxerxes, or high king, had dominion over all Persia, while the Darius appeared to be both heir and governor of the satrapy of Babylon. This relationship between Artaxerxes and the Darius is also symbolized by the varying lengths of the ram's two horns. Here's Daniel 8.4. I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beasts might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand. But a goat, a ram has a hand? Idiom, huh? Uh, could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Again, the beasts represent nations or kingdoms. The pushing is vocabulary that goes along with how hoofed animals threaten and claim territory. The kingdom of the Persians and the Medes expanded in every direction except eastward. In verse 3, the ram is standing by a river. That is an amazingly critical detail, because when the ram is overthrown, it is in a great battle before the Granicus River. The battle with Alexander the Great took place right in front of this river in 334 BC, at least 205 years after the revelation was given in Daniel 8.5. That's when the prophecy was finally fulfilled. Daniel chapter 5, verse 5. And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth and touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Greece is to the west of Persia, and Alexander dominated the entire west before he mar marched on Persia. The goat not touching the ground seems to indicate the great speed of the Greek advance. In Daniel 7, this great speed is communicated by the choice of a leopard to re that represents the Greeks. Daniel 8.21 explains the meaning, meaning of the goat and his horn. And the rough goat, a he-goat, is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. A male goat would be more aggressive. I don't know much about goats and sheep, but wouldn't one expect the ram to win the battle with the goat? On paper, Alexander should have been overwhelmed by the armies of Darius III. Some cite weaponry, others cite Alexander's tactics, others fault the culture of Persia in those days, but all stand in amazement when they behold Alexander's impossible victory. Daniel 8, 6 to 7. And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped on him. And there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Again, the vision communicates passing time. When hoofed animals kill one another, the victorious animal stamps the losing animal. But wow, what a vision. See that in technicolor? Uh, there are actually three decisive victories that led to Alexander's undisputed conquest of Persia and to the death of Darius III. Hence that passing time and the stamping, it, it all has significance. The first is the battle uh, at the Granicus River in 334 BC. Because the ram and the goat battle before the river, plainly this is the battle foretold in the vision. Talk about the accuracy of God's word. The last, <clears throat> the last battle was the battle of Guagamela in 331 BC. The fate of the ram's two horns is a challenging prophecy, despite representing changing dominion within Persia, because the goat's horn, the goat, because <clears throat> Changing dominion within Persia, because the goats, or Alexander's horns, represent specific kings, one would also expect the ram's horns to represent a specific king. Uh, once the uh, growth from the, of the horns ceased, 
a specific moment in time in which there were two kings in Persia would seem to be foretold. Indeed, the conquest of, in the conquest of Persia, two kings were killed, but information on the exact role of the second king is not clear. Neither Alexander nor his armies killed Darius III, but in the process of conquest, Darius III was killed by Bessus, who uh, then declared himself king. Bessus tried to hold the Eastern Empire, but was arrested by the Persians, or by Persians working for Greeks, depends who you ask, and he was delivered to Alexander for execution. Uh, Bessus was the governor of the satrapy of Bactria. According to Livius.org, this satrapy was incorporated into the Achaemenid Empire, the uh, which is the Persian Empire, as a special satrapy that was sometimes ruled by the crown prince or intended heir. It is interesting that Bessius did not think twice about declaring himself king according to the full title of Persian kings, in language similar to Astyages, he proclaimed himself king of the universe. Uh, perhaps these two specific kings were the ram's broken horns. Daniel 8.8 8 also communicates passing time. Therefore, the he-goat waxed very great, and he was strong, and the great horn was broken, for it came, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. As in the vision of the ram, the size of the goat's great horn shows the magnitude of the go goat's dominion. In Daniel 8, 21 to 22, the angel interprets D Daniel's vision of the great horn being broken. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. While there is some debate among historians, a Babylonian star diary dates the death of Alexander the Great in June of 323 BC. Hence, if the latest that Daniel could have received this prophecy was 539 BC, this prophecy of Alexander's death was given at least 260 years before it was fulfilled. The idiom in Daniel 8.8, with the four notable kings toward the four winds of heaven, simply means that the four kings were scattered to every corner of Alexander's the Great's kingdom. In other words, the entirety of Alexander's kingdom was divided among these kings. Curiously, this idiom uh, occurs in Jeremiah 49, 35 through 37 concerning Elam, that core province of the Persian empire. Thus said the Lord of hosts in Jeremiah 49, 35. Thus said the Lord of hosts, behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the chief of their might. And upon Elam will I bring the four winds from the four quarters of the heaven and will scatter them toward all those winds. And there shall be no nation whither the outcasts of Elam shall not come. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before them that seek their life. And I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, said the Lord, and I will send the sword after them till I have consumed them. Sometime before 587 BC, the year in which the temple was destroyed, which is also the last year we have a record of Jeremiah's life, Jeremiah foretold the fall of the Persian Empire in 331 BC. His prophecy was fulfilled uh, at least 256 years after it was given. We get used to being to the Bible being really accurate, but the word just doesn't, the world just doesn't know this stuff. One of the things I might try to do before I put this attachment up with the session is to list all the prophecies and the fulfillment of those prophecies. It's remarkable. The world just doesn't know. They have no clue. Jeremiah's prophecy included the idiom with the four winds. To simplify this for my own thinking, I've labeled this form of the idiom as heaven exhale, exhaling the four winds. It's not like the winds blew a quarter of the Persians in a straight line to the north, and another march of Persians ended up heading straight south. No, the heavens exhaled on the Persians and scattered them everywhere. They were scattered in every direction. They were utterly and completely scattered. Uh, the second form this idiom takes is what for simplicity and memory's sake, I term the inhalation form. This form of the idiom can be found in Ezekiel 37, nine through 10. Then he said to me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy son of man, and say to the wind, thus that the Lord God come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. 
So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. You know, the Persians had a kind of a Marine Corps uh, that their kings named the Immortals. Ah, talk about Immortals. What about Ezekiel's army? Ezekiel 37 is probably laughing it up. Anyhow, instead of the winds going outwards from the heaven, they are being summoned from the four corners to raise the dead who were on their way to heaven. This inhalation form of the idiom is very important for Matthew 24, 31. Yeah, even though you change languages and you change testaments and you change covenants, uh, the idiom remains the same, same author. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from his four winds, the one end, from the one end of heaven to the other, just as the wind is summoned from every corner of the earth and arrives from the uttermost parts of the earth. So when it's exhaled, the reigns of the four kings who will arise in Alexander's empire are foretold to rule over every last inch of it. Daniel 8.8 8 also contains the difficult Hebrew phrase, but not in his power. All the commentaries say that this means that the four kings uh, would not rule according to the power of Alexander the Great. This seems self-evident, but what would that really mean? Is Daniel foretelling that these four would not conquer other land masses the size of Alexander's empire? Doesn't seem to make too much sense about why Daniel would prophesy that. The common Hebrew preposition here uh, should not be translated in or with. Instead, it should be translated by. The four kings would arise, but not by Alexander's strength. The Hebrew word translated strength is translated might in Genesis 49.3, where Jacob speaks of Reuben. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. One of the uses of strength can indicate progeny, especially of an heir. In Jacob's case, he would speak of the rest of his strength, of his progeny in prophecy all through Genesis 49. Indeed, both translations of in his strength or by his strength are technically possible. But applying the principle that the translation of a prophecy that would be of greatest profit to God's people is its best translation, means that the best translation is that the four kings did not arise by Alexander's strength. This is because none of these four kings were of his blood. None were his genetic heirs. Indeed, none were even his legal heirs. The prophecy would be exceptionally profitable for God's people because the successors of Alexander the Great would carry on with wars and murders in the time of uh, his heir, in the name of his heir, Alexander IV, for 14 years. Also, this passage is the cousin of a passage we'll hit next week. It's so cool. They're both structurally related. One is the pattern of the other. They're mirror reflections. Um, anyway, the elliptical parts of the first member, which we're studying tonight, can be filled in from that second passage, which we'll hit next week. And there'll be elliptical parts of next week's passage that can be filled in from this passage. Uh, I'm sorry. You know, that's absolutely ridiculous. No human could ever write like this. This is what I mean by the study of the Old Testament is for our learning, that by patience and bearing up under, uh, we might have comfort and hope. The deeper one looks into the word of God, the more one sees how supernaturally perfect the Bible is. His presence with us is in the word and in us, and we just connect the dots. Uh, the prophecy of Daniel 8.8 8, then, as augmented by the angel's interpretation, communicates the passing of time from Alexander's death in 323 until the murder of his last heir in 309 BC. What follows is the fourth war of Alexander's successors. These are the successors that are named from the Greek word for successor, and they're called the Diodaci. This fourth war of the Diodaci concluded in 301 BC. Go ahead and share a screen with you so you can see what's going on here. Okay, we can see it here. In the immediate aftermath of Alexander the Great's death in 323 BC, no kings arose at all. Instead, in the treaty called the Partition of Babylon, the successors of Alexander, whom the history calls Diadochi, uh, divided Alexander's kingdom into this mess. You see that? Just completely divided up. No kings just all partitions with generals ruling things, satrapies, I guess. However, after three years, three different wars and the murder of Alexander IV, just before the Battle of Ipsus, the empire looked like this mess. Getting a little bit more defined. Ptolemy's in the south, Antigonus is in the north, 
Seleucus is off in the east, and a couple guys up here, Cassandra and Lysima, are way off in the west. Alexander the Great's last heir was secretly murdered in 309 BC by the order of his regent, Cassander. Where is Cassander? There, they have a different spelling, Cassandros up there. He's the regent, the guy's supposed to be taking care of the king's kid. Uh, however, by 306 BC, Antigonus must have learned of the assassination for he proclaimed himself king of all Alexander's empire. And that would make everyone else uh, that resisted his rule traitors and insurrectionists. What resulted was the fourth war of the Diadache. The war is a series, this war is a series of battles that looked like the pickup football game called Cream the Carrier. That's the one where everyone tries to tackle the one crazy person who wanted to carry the football. Uh, the ball carry in this case was Antigonus. And uh, an interesting summary of the wars of the Diadache can be found on YouTube. I'll put that link up there. Did I do it? Did I, do it? I think I did. It's in here somewhere. But anyway, uh, it's kind of crazy. But still, after Antigonus declared himself king in 306 BC, uh, Lysim Lysimachus called, declared himself king in 306 BC. Ptolemy declares himself king in 305. Seleucus declares himself king in 305. And Cassandra uh, declared himself king in 305. There are now five kings and five kingdoms, not four as Daniel 8.8 8 prophesies. However, all are contested rules. If these were kings during the reckoning of the Hebrew kings, God would mark each reign with a mathematical paradox that would show contested years of rule and soul years of rule, and only the victorious kings would be reckoned. In like manner, Daniel's prophecy only reckoned the reigns of the four kings who remained after Antigonus had been killed and a treaty recognizing the division of his kingdom had been ratified by Lassimachus and Seleucus. Now, if someone were to compare this map to the one of Alexander's empire at its greatest extent, there would be no difference. The four kings cover every inch of Alexander's former, former kingdom. And this is what the map should be if it comes up. Oh, there it's down here. Oh yeah, there's the YouTube video. You can see the kill the carrier thing. It's hard to see the Seleucid Empire's down here. Do you have one, two, three, four? And those are the four kings. The Hellenistic kings left after the aftermath of Alexander the Great would continue to subtly shift until there were only three kings. I'll wait to next week to bring up that map. Still, do you remember what the bear that represented Rome had in its mouth? Do you remember the three ribs? I kind of like ribs, so I remember them. But I've never had goat ribs. When the Romans rose, there were only three kings ruling over Alexander's divided empire. What do you think? Was that bear eating mutton? Or was that bear eating goat? By the way, everyone wants the bear to be Russia or California. But if we let the Bible speak, there's no way it could be either of those guys. In any case, this snapshot in time with the first kings of Alexander's empire is on focus for Daniel's prophecy of the kings who would stand up in Alexander's place. Furthermore, the borders of the kingdoms enveloping uh, Jerusalem would not change in the initial wars of the Diadache. They would only change later during the six Syrian wars that, by God's grace, we'll see next session. But the events of these six conflicts would not be completely foretold until Daniel's vision of the return of Jesus Christ in Daniel 11. Daniel 8, 8 through 9 begins the allegory for Christ's second coming. It says, uh, Therefore, the he-goat waxed very great. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and forth came up four notable ones that uh, toward the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them came a fourth little horn, which waxed exceedingly great, toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. That's Israel, or Judah. Here, the closeness in biblical meanings for king and kingdom become very plain. When the horns arise, they are kingdoms. When the horn is broken, a king is defeated and dies. Out of one of the four kingdoms, another king and his kingdom will arise. This king is Antiochus IV, and during his reign, he will conquer Jerusalem twice, defile the temple, and cause the daily sacrifice to cease. Antiochus IV sets a pattern for an allegory for the coming of the Antichrist. There are many ways to say this. We could say Antiochus prefigures the Antichrist, or we could say Antiochus is a type or two posts of the Antichrist, 
and that the Antichrist is the antitupos or antitype of Antiochus IV. We'll use this later language because it seems easiest. It doesn't sound easiest, right? But actually it is. Uh, but no matter how we cut it, Antiochus IV was a real jerk. We'll use Greek words from the Bible because the English to me sounds flat. A tupos has some depth. Many points of the tupos by extended metaphor and narrative outline the anti-tupos. All right, scroll on the screen now. Oh, this is the common list of kings and there. Most of the commentary have this, the four kings, right? They have the snapshot, correct? And there's the outline of the kings and their provinces, kingdoms. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this here. So as I'm talking, you can follow along. Reconciling the apparent contradiction between Daniel 8.23 and Daniel 8.17 illustrates this use of tupos and anti-tupos between the historic events and the picture drawn by the extended metaphor, which picture is the anti-tupos. Uh, Daniel 8.17 says the vision is at the time of the end, but the angel speaks of the fifth horn as being in the later days of their kingdom, the kingdom of the Hellenists, the, the kingdom of brass. Since Daniel 2's revelation of the image of the empires the anti, uh, tells us the Antichrist does not arise until after the empire of iron, that's another contradiction. The resolution of this contradiction is to recognize the Antiochus IV epiphanies is a tupos of the Antichrist. That is, he is a foreshadowing figure who foretells and reveals the enemy's doom in an allegory. Daniel's vision, vision from Daniel 8, 3 through 11 foretells of events in the kingdoms of silver and brass. Then Daniel 8, 12 through 14 reveals the foreshadowing allegory of the events of the last time, the tupos. In turn, the angel's explanation of the vision in Daniel 8, 20 to 23 concerns events in the kingdom of kingdoms of silver and brass. But in Daniel 8, 24, the angel explains the meaning of the foreshadowing allegory the anti tupos In the chart here below, uh, you can see slight alterations made in the angel's summary uh, that are the explicitly stated advance, events uh, of the foreshadowed uh, Antichrist, foreshadowed by an, uh, Antiochus IV. I've also pl I've placed the outline of this double meaning stuff in two different charts. Hopefully one of them will help. So you can see the first one and there's some slight differences. Uh, cast down some of the host shall destroy the mighty and holy people. So that's the that's what's gonna happen in Revelation. Uh, the enemy gets them all, kills them all, then the resurrection of the just. Here, just some, some of the stars. And then not by, not by his own power. And then let's see, boasted against the prince of the host. That may turn out to be uh, Judah Maccabees, daily uh, sacrifice was taken away, and the Holy of Holies was cast down. Then here's what I call the allegorical handle, where the angel's words really start to show that this uh, we're talking about a foreshadowing figure. So the host, uh, a host given to him, that's not historical in Daniel 8.12. And so, and it reflects not by his own power, which the angels already given us. And against the daily sacrifice, they're not historical. Oh, he cast down the truth. Again, not historical. That's going to be happening later. Uh, it practiced and prospered. And then craft to prosper in his hand is what the, how the angel puts it. Those are the same. And then Daniel 8.13 and Daniel 8.26, 2300 days, evening in the morning. And I put together an outline as well. This might work better for you. But it'll be up there. You can look at it at your leisure uh, once it's posted. But yeah, uh, Antiochus and the Antichrist, his rise, his rule, and his doom are the three basic categories. And then these are the various verses. We kind of go uh, work through them. You can see that some are the anti-tupos. Some are both. Uh, at the latter time of their kingdom, to me, that's the tupos foreshadowing what's coming up uh, after the church has been gathered, but some may contend that that's both, that the Antichrist will arise from the Seleucid Empire or thereabouts. So who knows? The transgression, uh, when the transgressors are come to the full, that's in both. A king of fierce countenance, an impudent king has the NAB, an insolent king has NAS, 
there's kind of a double meaning to this thing. Um, Antioch is for impudent and insolent, but the Antichrist fears countenance and understanding dark sentences, understanding stratagems, and that's both. Um, Antioch is for connived his way into getting the rain, and uh, he also sneaks his way into taking Jerusalem for the second time. Uh, and then his rule, his power shall be mighty. That's the antitupos because it's not historical, not by his own power. Revelation 13, 2, the dragon gave him his power. That's the antitupos. Uh, and he shall destroy wonderfully. Wonderful things will he destroy. And again, that, that's both, but you can kind of see there's a double sense to it. Uh, amazingly destructive is more a reflection of the antitupos. Wonderful things will he destroy, like in the in Jerusalem, that's Antiochus four, but both. Uh, and shall prosper and practice, and what they're pros what's prospering in practice is deceit, and that's both. Uh, just the degree is what's different. And shall destroy the mighty and holy people, both. Uh, the enemy gets them all in the period after the church is left. Uh, but they were still getting destroyed, process thereof by Antiochus IV. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And here's another translation. And by his understanding, he hath also caused deceit to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart, that's both. And by peace or stealth shall he destroy many. That two post is very historical and it foreshadows the enemy. And then his doom, and he shall also stand up against the prince of princes. That's the anti-tupos, uh, because Antiochus IV had no way of doing that, because the Lord Jesus Christ had not been raised from the dead yet, was not seated up on high, so he could not rebel against the prince of princes. So that's non-historical. The anti-tupos does that. Uh, but he shall be broken without a hand. And this is for both of them. Antiochus IV dies mysteriously away from Jerusalem. Uh, both the te uh, and that's both, and then the temple is contained is cleansed after two thousand three hundred days. That could be the antitupus only, or it could be both, but it's certainly the antitupus. All right, and let's see the seventy weeks. We'll be there in a second. You don't need to see that yet. <laughs> okay, let me go ahead and go through some of this again. Um, here's Daniel thirteen eight thirteen through fourteen. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said. Uh, unto uh, that certain saint which spake, how long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of the desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, almost six and a half years, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The cleansing, according to both Josephus and 1 Maccabees, took place three years after Antiochus IV Epiphanes took Jerusalem the second time and defiled the temple. This would have been from 167, uh, 167 BC. Oh, 0.9 BC, because it's the ninth month. That's where I wrote that down. 167.9 BC until uh, 164.9 BC. This count does not match the time frame of Daniel's prophecy. However, the vision's beginning is meant to, if the vision's beginning is meant to include Antiochus IV Epiphany's first sack of Jerusalem as well, then the count would start from 169 BC, counting uh, a Hebrew year as having 320 days and tossing in two leap months. This count could uh, almost be six Hebrew years, uh, hits 1,930 days. This is pretty close. For instance, the missing 70 days could be the result of the beginning of the vision, including uh, Antiochus IV's gathering of his armies and his march from Egypt, both of which could easily have begun 70 days before Antiochus IV's arrival at Jerusalem in 169 BC. Reverend Nestle wrote about this a little bit more precisely. I'll just kind of read from, from what he's written here. And I think we'll call it a night. I was going to do um, the uh, seven, uh, 70 weeks but I think we're out of time. So let's go ahead and just kind of close it out here. It gives a time span of 2,300 days. This is exactly 78 lunar months. When one does a comparison with the book of Maccabees, the time span does not fit the total length of the time the temple was actually desecrated. Antiochus IV set up the abomination on the 15th of Chislu and sacrificed on the 25th of Chislu. 
and in 167 BC. The temple wasn't cleansed, was temple was cleansed three years later when Second Maccabees, according to Second Maccabees 452, and it was on the 25th of Chislu. But there is more. It also includes the phase trot phrase trodden underfoot. Historical rec history records the temple was rededicated on the 25th of Kislev in 164, which was the inception of the Jewish, Jewish feast of Hanukkah. If we consult Parker and Dubrudenstein's ancient Jewish calendar, uh, we can see that the years 170 BC and 167 BC had an intercalendary 13 months. Uh, that means 8R2 in them. So counting backwards 78 months from the cleansing of the temple and the end of the abomination of the desolation brings us to the end of the month Av, the fifth month in 170 AD. Antiochus IV fought the Egyptians in the Battle of Mount Kassos in early November of 170 BC. According to Parker and Dubenstein, that would have been in the middle of the eighth month. The beginning of the 2,300 days was the 26th of Av. The month Av is always 30 days long. This date would have been 80 days before the battle. Uh, Orbis Stanford EDU website calculates that a Roman legion would take about 50 days to travel the 300 miles from Damascus to the battle site of Pelusium via Jerusalem at a speed of ox carts. So it is not implausible at all that the sanctuary was trodden underfoot by advanced elements from Antiochus in the summer of 170. He certainly had been meddling in the priestly affairs throughout most of his entire reign. Hence, although a strong case can be made that the 2,300 days did take place from the time Antiochus IV began to gather his army in Egypt and march on Palestine until the temple was cleansed, the rest of Daniel 8, 12 through 13 no longer describes the two posts in the kingdom of brass, but instead reveals the events of the end time, the anti-two posts. So the 2,300, if the 2,300 2, days does not describe the two posts, it certainly describes the anti-two posts. Likewise, in Daniel 8, 24 through 25, Gabriel explains the meanings of the foreshadowing two posts point by point by revealing the sixth administration events. However, in Daniel 8, 25, the angel speaks only of the events of the end time. These do not seem to be foreshadowed by the literal history of Antiochus. Uh, casting the truth, casting down the truth, and prospering in Jerusalem does not fit the historical record. Gabriel says in Daniel 8.26, and the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. This may be uh, the title of the entire vision, or it may be a reference to Gabriel by Gabriel to the dark 2,300 days when the period of the wrath. Uh, begins and the Antichrist sits in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. The new horn, the fifth horn, alluded prophetically to Antiochus IV Epiphanes. He was a Seleucid usurper king, hence he was a horn rising up from uh, one of the four original horns of Alexander's kingdom, and he reigned, and his reign occurred in the later days of the kingdom of brass. He came to power and remained in power through clever palace intrigues, as uh, Daniel 8.23 suggests. His influence grew to the south and to the east of the Seleucid Empire when he conquered much of Egypt, which was Ptolemy's empire. In so doing, Judah, the pleasant land, fell beneath his rule. In his second invasion of Jerusalem, Antiochus IV did desecrate the temple and stop the daily sacrifice at the temple altar. The host of heaven refers to the Judeans killed by Antiochus IV. He, managed, he magnified himself and boasted himself against the prince of the host. Perhaps this prince was the rebel leader Judas Maccabeus, Maccabeus meaning the hammer, Judas the hammer, for Judas outlived Antiochus, retook Jerusalem, and cleansed the temple. Hence, Antiochus IV was also a foreshadowing type for the Antichrist as given in 2 Thessalonians 3-4. through Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. The man of sin may be revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The record of Antiochus IV, of course, could not be the abomination of the desolation spoken of in Matthew 24, 15, for the events of First Maccabees had long since passed. Wherefore, when ye shall see the abomination of the desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. We'll take a look at that next week when we hit the acceptable year of the Lord. Uh, but that should hold us for this evening.